everyone, and welcome to The Propcast. My name is Louisa Dickens, co-founder of Ella Mulry and board director of the UKPA, and I shall be your weekly host. Each week for 30 minutes, we'll be connecting the VCs, prop tech startups, and real estate professionals globally, and assist in bridging that famous communication gap we all love talking about. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, we are talking about innovation and acquisitions of technologies into real estate businesses. And we are joined by John Sikaitis from Amazon Young, who is their principal and their chief innovation officer. So welcome, John. Thank you so much for having me. So excited to, to be here and, and to, to chat with your audience. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, John. Um, at Amazon Young, Young, everyone. John is the lead innovator, driving data, analytics, visualization, client product development, customer product development, client engagement, and go to market and pursue strategy development, implementation, and execution. Oh my, that was such a mouthful to say. <laughs> um, John is also a member of the Global Executive Committee, driving strategy and operations of the firm. Avison Young creates economic, social, and environmental value powered by people. Now, as a real estate advisor, the firm helps clients realize the full potential of spaces and assets through its global intelligence platform, which delivers insights and competitive advantage for real estate occupiers, owners, and investors. Prior to that, he was managing director of JLL in research and business development for 14 years. John graduated from Georgetown University with a BS in Spanish. So John, uh, welcome obviously to the show. Um, I'd love to hear you talk us through your journey from studying Spanish to becoming the head of innovation for one of the largest commercial property services firms in the world. So why don't you talk us through that whole journey? Yeah, it's kind of random, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, so 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 obviously, you know, my, my focus in university was was liberal arts, and and through that, really start to start to kind of gain a tremendous amount of interest as well as kind of passion and curiosity for how kind of cities operated. Um, and that was always probably something that was fascinating to me as as a as a youngster too. Is just you know the building blocks of kind of a given you know, neighborhood city, obviously kind of Legos were key to that, right? Um, but, um, you know, what, what my focus really over my professional career has been uh, on the data side. And through that kind of understanding of data, I really got to grow a significant amount around kind of understanding of markets and how they kind of interact with each other. And then through that kind of interaction, interaction of markets, Obviously, you know, sales folks and kind of brokers and consultants were really kind of leveraging me to kind of go out to market with them to engage their clients. And that's really kind of where the, the, the special sauce was created. As, as I started to kind of get really familiar with kind of clients across both the occupational aspect as well as the development and investor front, really got to understand exactly what they were kind of looking for, what the inefficiencies of the market were, particularly as it related to kind of data analytics and technology. And so through that, that's kind of led me to, to my kind of current role today is through that kind of past of really understanding data and markets, you know, internal customers and obviously kind of external clients, it's really um, much more efficient, much more productive to obviously kind of develop technologies around that. So we kind of built a, a really awesome group of internal experts around kind of all those kind of vertical focuses that you've kind of shared before. And, you know, that kind of collaborative collective group of people um, is just, you know, producing a, a ton of um, data analytics and technology that are engaging our clients and our wannabe clients in, in such a different way than, than, than history. Um, and um, I'd also love, love to hear a little bit more about how you first got involved in the data side you know it's not in the school curriculum just yet yeah it's not in your Spanish degree well I'd be very surprised if it is how did you first get interested in it because there's a lot more um people getting involved data is everything we all need to be well we don't all need to be trained up in it but we lots of people are doing you know machine learning courses what was your first introduction to it it's a it's a great question um I mean uh, with data obviously you know the, the folks who really kind of specialize in data, obviously kind of have more um, you know, organizational skills. So there's kind of obviously kind of an inter interconnectivity there. There's obviously kind of an interconnectivity with kind of analytics and kind of how you 
you know, look at kind of trends and patterns and analyses. So I always had an interest there. Um, it was something that obviously I didn't have a background in, but um, I always like to say to kind of my, my team that you, you kind of know when someone's really kind of skilled at data because you kind of look at something as basic as kind of an Excel sheet and you can even either see it very structured and consistent and clean, or you can see it's kind of like, you know, Swiss cheese. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my, my spreadsheets always kind of were, were the, the former, where, where they were obviously kind of, uh, obviously kind of very organized and, and comprehensive uh, and consistent. And I think that's really kind of the hallmark of, of kind of data. I think a lot of folks in today's world, we speak so much around technology, but technology with date, without data is useless. And so, you know, our approach here at Avis and Young is really we're a data first kind of mindset that looks at data and then kind of wraps technology around that, as mm -hmm. opposed to the opposite in terms of building technology and then kind of forcing data into it. We're truly trying to understand kind of the insights, the information, the data our clients need in order to kind of transact most effectively in the market. And um, talking about your, um, your current role, Chief Innovation Officer. Um, lots yeah. of businesses are hiring these innovation officers. Um, everyone's trying to draw up job specs for it, and it's they're fairly all-encompassing roles. When you moved from uh, Jones Lang LaSalle, did you um did you go in as this role, or did you develop into it over the you know the years? Yeah, it's so I you know at JLL I I did not kind of play that role, but I played uh, a, a large part in terms of you know conceptualizing products you know that kind of went to market particularly over my last five years there. And so I kind of really got comfortable and familiar, not obviously in the coding side, I, I kind of rely on, <laughs> on my team, obviously to, to do that, but really more on the conceptualization side and on the UI and the UX in terms of how you know, our people and our clients you know, really want to kind of access and, and um, navigate and interact with that technology. So here, you know, when I started at Avis and Young about 14 months ago, obviously that kind of was my mandate is to, to build that practice and to kind of build the products that obviously kind of sit alongside that practice. The, the real kind of difference here, I think that we've kind of built that, I, that I've seen in terms of a lot of different places is that our innovation strategy is completely interconnected with our business development and kind of go-to-market client strategy. So we're not just kind of conceptualizing big ideas um, as it relates to kind of potentially what the future of the market is, but we're really trying to kind of test that, those out in a pitch-like and a business development-like setting. And then if obviously they're successful, then mm -hmm. we're kind of scaling those to kind of more of a platform type product. So we really are, you know, not only data first, but obviously kind of client first too. And speaking of strategy, early this year, Avaston Young um, was extremely busy um, and went through a acquisition. Um, probably a very difficult time to go through an acquisition as well. Um, <laughs> how did this uh, M&A come about? And I guess what, why the, why the acquisition too? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. Obviously it's, it's a really important kind of milestone and, and stepping stone for us as an organization. You know, this is our, our first kind of prop tech acquisition, um, you know, hopefully one of many to come. Um, but we, we saw really kind of a common ground um, with, with what we were kind of and how we were approaching the market and obviously kind of how trust was. I kind of look at it first and foremost in terms of you know, really kind of threefold. One is obviously kind of the people. Um, and mm -hmm. we kind of had a significant um, you know, a, amount of kind of uh, you know, interest and, and kind of alignment, obviously, in kind of the type of folks that kind of you know, were part of the trust organization and that are part of kind of our organization, particularly as it relates to the innovation and technology front. So just a kind of a great people alignment, particularly from a technical aspect of things. Um, and obviously those teams are now fully integrated in Avis and Young and, and kind of a big part of, you know, our software development, our data management, our data strategy um, aspects of the business. Two is um, how the product was actually, you know, created and, and launched um, really kind of fit into our strategy of, of kind of product development in that, you know, really put an intense amount of focus on kind of the UI and the UX and kind of a different UI and UX and kind of engagement than traditionally how you know, normalized commercial real estate data providers would engage an audience. Much more human, um, much more visual, much more, uh, even if folks don't understand data, a setting and an experience that it was understandable. 
So I mm. think, you know, that just that how the product was created, particularly from a UI UX, um, really kind of fit with kind of the products that we were kind of building here. Um, and then third was, uh, and, and kind of equally important to the other two, an intense focus on the micro movement of the, of, of, of the market. And the beauty is that, you know, over the past 14 months since we arrived here at Davis & Young, our focus was really kind of on the um, market level, the asset level, the entity level, and the transaction level from a data perspective, in terms of that platform of which our future technologies would be built from. The, the trust kind of platform was really at that space level. And so you think about the one missing piece that we did not kind of build into our architecture in that first 12 months we were sure planning to after 12 months their their real focus on our product side was kind of almost exclusively that and then obviously kind of the workflows um, from a people perspective that kind of stemmed from that kind of space level entity so even though integration obviously is not um easy in any in any front um there's just a lot of just you know natural synergies between products people vision and mindset that I, that I think just the alignment was kind of key there. You know, we'd been engaged with the trust team for um, more than a year on kind of various opportunities with partnerships and, and kind of different aspects. And then, you know, as it kind of shifted into a potential acquisition, um, you know, obviously it kind of changed course, um, but it, it's, it's, it's been, uh, it's been exciting. I can imagine it must have been quite the journey. Um going through the acquisition, I think you would just went into the agreement just before we all went into lockdown and the pandemic really um, started to sort of cause chaos. Um, but congratulations on the acquisition um, nonetheless. Um, so obviously you're acquiring technologies. Are you building technologies in-house as well then? Yes. Yeah, so we, we were already building you know, technologies in-house um, you know, prior to the tr trust acquisition. And, and really that was our you know, our base platform that we kind of built over the, the prior 12 months. And, and obviously now, you know, Trust had their technologies, we had ours and, um, you know, those are being kind of integrated um, into kind of one, one seamless platform with a ideal kind of integration kind of uh, date of uh, the end of Q1. So, you know, we're very much, our team, particularly on the, on the technical kind of software development, product development side, is uh you know full steam ahead in terms of obviously not just data architecture data mapping but also kind of what that refined and elevated kind of ui ux is from a product perspective so no doubts yeah super busy um no sleep for the wicked um <laughs> there's um often talk and a general hesitation of the real estate uh businesses and the, the consulting world about acquiring um external technologies um one obviously integrating it getting uh the current employees to use it you know throughout the yeah. business how have you found that yeah so we we decided you know pre-acquisition uh, obviously the only way this would be successful is if the products were fully integrated so so not kind of you know an interconnected in integration with you know product speaking to another product, but, you know, as it relates to kind of our end audience, which is you know, two, twofold, obviously kind of all of our people, Davis and Young, and then, you know, our clients, um, we wanted it to be kind of a seamless experience. If you think of what I kind of mentioned before, you know, our, our platform was really kind of focused on that, that property, that transaction, that activity, that entity level, they're just focused on the space level. It wouldn't be a natural human experience if there were kind of two products even if they were kind of inter integrated quite seamlessly. So, you know, we decided, and, you know, the, the trust technical team was, was fully aligned with this, particularly kind of post acquisition is that the only kind of, um, you know, integration has to be kind of full integration, both on obviously kind of the data architecture side, as well as kind of the, the end kind of one product. So that's, you know, that's what we decided upon and we haven't kind of strayed from that. We we've actually probably, um, you know, double down on that in terms of adding kind of future products into that kind of, you know, integration of the, the, what is kind of really four products today. Um, so, you know, we're, we're full steam ahead and, and excited for our, our users to kind of have one place to go to interact with the market. 
must be fairly difficult integrating this whilst everyone is um, sitting at home in various states. Oh, completely. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny you, you mentioned that because it's not just obviously the integration, um, the due diligence and the acquisition, mm. right? This, this is a, a unique one in that, um, you know, particularly for our CEO, Mark Rose, definitely probably the first acquisition that he's done of dozens, hundreds probably over his career, where never really, you know, shook hands with kind of the folks on the other side of the table. So um, really a, a learning lesson on many fronts um, from us, but particularly with the challenges of COVID, it was everything was obviously digital. Um, and you know, the, the teams, um, you know, still are, know each other from Zoom, not from <laughs> not from seeing each other and, and uh, collaborating together in, in person. Um there's often talk about the importance of senior management being on board of innovation. I've heard Mark is fully on board of it. It must be reassuring knowing that you have him backing you to push forward with um, these innovation projects you probably have ahead of you. Yeah, it's um, Mark is by far, a, um, you know, the, the biggest supporter uh, of kind of uh, you know, our overall kind of data strategy and technology strategy, um, but also, a, you know, a deep visionary. Um, and I think, you know, Mark early, early on in, in kind of late 2019 kind of recognized, you know, that the plan um, that we had would obviously kind of be, you know, revenue generating. And, and um, it, it's funny, M Mark has always been a huge supporter, but obviously kind of with business wins, uh, the support among kind of the executive leadership level has kind of grown to a a tremendous amount. Mark put a, a revenue target on on kind of our products really uh, in the in the latter part of 2019, and we've been able to to 10x that revenue target. Um, so obviously, you know, with success and with wins, um, you know, folks who weren't necessarily kind of visionaries have really kind of bought on in a substantial way. As you were really trying to change, and I know this word is used so much, disrupt, but really kind of change and disrupt you know, how we engage with a future client at the point of sale um, and really trying to instill in that, you know, future client, the experience of how we want to you know, carry that client relationship out. And, you know, that has for us and for our vision, that the significant amount of that comes with the uh, data and analytics and technology and digitization. Um, you know, that's, how we want to kind of interact. We don't, we don't want to interact with everything mm -hmm. over Excel and PowerPoint and PDFs. <laughs> the traditional way this, industry, I mean, if you think about it, the industry really hasn't evolved mm. um, in some, it, it forever. In that, you know, a great product, right? I'm not, not bemoaning it, but we are still a Microsoft Office um, industry. You know, if you think about it, if Microsoft Office went down for a couple of days, the industry would go into, you know, just, Com complete standstill but that's how everyone kind of interacts and, and we're really trying to change that we've been successful in the past really since since uh you know the the impact of COVID started in march uh we've been really successful in terms of changing what that point of sale experience kind of looks like um and uh you know we, we hope to do that in even more of a dramatic way in the future Position yourself to thrive with a five-week course that covers the essentials of designing, developing, marketing and operating offices in 2021 and beyond. Check out the Future Proof Office course at realinnovationacademy.com. Quote LMRE for a 10% discount. You mentioned disruptors and I guess more importantly, successful disruptors. Are there any products you've seen in the market uh, that you really think has a value prop proposition in real estate, which you might be looking at, or maybe just one which you're interested in personally? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a ton out there. I, I think, um, you know, the, 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 some are extremely successful. Some probably don't have kind of a, a life to them, particularly in the current environment. Mm. Um, for me, it's really kind of all around, you know, the data that's collected within those products. Uh, and, and then obviously how, how that's kind of productized. Um, you know, I, I think in terms of just, you know, volume of data, I need to know they're not they're the most successful prop, you know, prop tech, obviously, but no one would consider them a prop tech. 
you know, when you look at CoStar and then you kind of look at, you know, their, their really kind of biggest, um, you know, peer VTS, you know, the, mm. the focus on data has been tremendous and obviously kind of the product has, uh, you know, enhanced um, because of that kind of focus on data. So obviously those are the two, two biggest ones, two bigger ones. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, really, again, a technology without a data strategy, it, not just for the services side of our business, is is um, is obviously not a successful strategy, but in particularly on prop tech, you know, what's what's kind of the unique data that's going to be kind of offered to a prospective client, uh, to a you know a prospective kind of acquirer that um, really kind of scales above the technology. Uh, I would always say, and I know I've heard some peers kind of say this, which is nice to hear, but technology just takes time, you know, time and money. It's <laughs> and a vision, obviously. The, the data is the hard part because it's constant and consistent. Um, your data can go awry within seconds. It can go awry within minutes. And so really kind of a constant, um, you know, focus on that is really kind of critical, I think, to kind of any prop tech kind of being, being a successful one. Yeah. And there's so much of it to sort out and it's bloody everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, we, we see this oftentimes in our own, in our, in the services side of the business, but um, you know, the, the flaw some, some entities um, focus on is they, they focus on the workflows from a technology perspective without actually addressing the base that connects those workflows. And so I think that, you know, that that's really kind of critical to understand is you know, to get maximum adoption, you have to think about kind of the base with the workflows, not just the workflows. Otherwise, there's just going to be kind of a limiting impact um, on kind of that kind of workflows, you know, usability as well as kind of adoption. And um, going back into, I guess, forecasting and trends in this space, Avison Young, uh, I think it was a couple of days ago, published a forecast for 2021. Very difficult to predict, especially as we definitely didn't predict uh, the pandemic coming up. But um, what what trends are you seeing sort of shaping the real estate space? What, st- what ones stick out for you? Yeah, no, our research team put that together, led by Nick Axford, and it was a great piece, very kind of thought-provoking. And, and obviously, as you say, <laughs> this environment is so challenging to to kind of be able to kind of look at tomorrow and, and say what's going to happen. Th- this is one that, you know, is, sits on the top of my mind. Um, I'm, I'm an urbanist by nature um, and kind of sit on the boards of kind of various uh, associations kind of, you know, focused in and around kind of cities. And um, I, you know, as an urbanist, I, I'm, I'm a little bit um, challenged and, and I, I think a little bit, um, you know, uh, probably frightened to kind of potentially see kind of what happens in some urbanized environments. Mm. Uh, because I, I say that because if you look at the, 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 the need for offices will always be there, but I don't know of a corporate um, right now that's not thinking about a, um, a shift in their workplace strategy, a shift in the flexibility of their kind of workforce and with that, probably a reduction in terms of the amount of space that they're kind of taking at any given space or across their portfolio. And, you know, from, you know, the clients that we work with and, you know, the, the, a lot of the, the prospects that we're kind of engaged with in the marketplace, when you hear from the corporate side, you know, there's roughly kind of a, a figure that stands out around 25 to 30% in terms of planning of, you know, uh, reduction or kind of shifting of, of kind of their office footprint. I bring up office because obviously the impact in any given urban environment, um, if you would see even a 10% reduction, but a lot of the corporates are saying higher in terms of obviously kind of office space, but then the impact it would have obviously on, on retail space. And then even kind of the impact as it relates to, if you think about, you know, not as dynamic of a city from both an office and a retail perspective, obviously that has a huge impact in terms of where residents want to move and want to live. So, you know, I, I hope we have kind of um, resolution sooner rather than later with kind of, you know, a vaccine and the implementation of that, because I think the longer, the longer this current normal stands, the more impactful it is to office space occupancy. 
Mm. which really has a tremendous impact, obviously, on kind of other adjacent occupancies, particularly within the retail segment and the multi-residential or multifamily segment. So, uh, you know, th- th- that's one that just, it's, um, it's something that's top of my mind. And mm. um, again, we don't, we, we hear from corporates, obviously, their, their focus in terms of reducing and, and shifting, obviously, kind of their workplace strategies. But um, right now, it, it looks like there's going to be a, you know, a, a, what you'd call a pretty drastic reduction in terms of the amount of office space, particularly in urban environments you know, over the next couple of years. I was um, shocked by a stat I was given earlier by a client in to I just this is in London. I'm talking about like changes from city to city, country to country. Only three percent of the London office market is flex, and next year it's going to be thirty percent. I don't know why, but I was under the impression that far more office was flex. But obviously, I know it's going to increase due to all the reasons you just said. But that's a it's a tiny amount. Um, tiny, yeah, you're right. Exactly. It's a tiny amount. It's grown a ton in the past 40 months. Um, I think the current environment, to your point, it, it probably grows. Then there's a pause, right? There's probably a current pause. But, you know, there's probably a big jump after that pause. You know, I, I look at my own personal habits and, and um, I don't see myself going back to an office five days a week ever. Uh, but I also don't want to be in in my home five days a week or even a couple days a week for that. But kind of you know, the, le- the leveraging of you know both traditional office space, but potentially kind of flexible space closer to housing, mm. I think is probably a hybrid that works for a lot of a lot of people. Um, you know, it's it's not glorious. You know, going and sitting in a work from home office adjacent to your bedroom which is adjacent to your kitchen which is adjacent to your <laughs> living room like that you know that's not uh, that's not sustainable either so then that's why i don't think you know a lot of folks would say you know the office is dead the office isn't dead it's just going to evolve and it's going to change and i think particularly our peers on the architectural side um you know are, are really you know ahead uh, as they usually are in terms of you know what is the office of the future the office of the future is that you know is that really you know um collaboration zone where you're kind of going to kind of meet up with your colleagues to engage, to share ideas, to potentially kind of pitch business, to meet with clients, et cetera. It might not be your space for where you do individualized work in the future. And that's okay. You know, that, that hasn't shifted obviously kind of in decades, but to your exact point, that's going to necessitate a need for a different type of office, which is probably more, you know, singular, which is probably more flexible, which, you know, probably is more in the vein of obviously kind of how the industry has grown so much in the past, you know, 36 to 40 months. So I don't think we're at that point where obviously we're not, I know we're not at that point where, you know, obviously there's not a lot of demand period for office space, whether for traditional or flexible, because everyone's kind of working from home for the most part. But, you know, once we kind of get out of this, I think you will see a pretty big uptick in, in, in the requirements for a kind of flexible space, particularly from, you know, from, from the corporate level. Lucky for all those businesses in that flex office space. And um, now, John, outside of um, work innovation, talking about office space, what else, what else are you involved in? What makes you tick? Yeah, so great question. I, I, I mean, I, I love a few different things. So one, fitness. I'm, I'm kind of a, a maniac, as it really more so from a, a mental perspective. But you know, mm. fitness to me is kind of super important in terms of keeping obviously kind of not only physically fit, but equally so kind of mentally and kind of emotionally fit. So, um, you know, that's something that's kind of part of my, I guess, part of my OCD. <laughs> what is it? Do you own a Peloton? Are you a runner, cyclist? I, I'm kind of more the traditional kind of gym route. Um, you know, I, I like the, also kind of the engagement, obviously, of, of you know, people in a, in a common environment. So I, I kind of more um, um, of the, uh, the gym route. And also kind of a little bit on the on the, on the running side. Um, I would say the other things that kind of really interest me: you know, cooking, uh, gardening, kind of outdoors, and really anything um, anything that really kind of uses that kind of level of creativity. Um, and obviously, kind of a, spending a ton of time with with uh, friends and family too. So, yeah, it sounds very sort of therapeutic. I think during this lockdown, 
as well, I've taken up running, I've taken up meditation, which I never used to believe in and just finding I could, I could use some tips there from you on that. <laughs> oh my God. I'm, I'm sort of, I mean, I've been through all the apps um, from Headspace to Calm. I mean, Matthew McConnelly sort of sending me to sleep. It's not a bad way to go. <laughs> <laughs> um but look, John. Um, unfortunately, on that note, we're coming to um, <laughs> we're coming to the end of the show. Uh, is there any bit of parting information you'd like to share with our audience? And please tell them the best way to connect with you and um, Amazon Young. Yeah, b- best way to connect you know to Amazon Young, AmazonYoung.com. We have a ton of information, obviously, kind of around our firm and, and kind of our future on our site. You know, for me, um, you know, LinkedIn, uh, John Sakaitis, S I K A I T I S. I think I'm probably one of the few out there. Uh, but, you know, hit me up, um, love to kind of just engage, um, obviously kind of with other like-minded folks around, um, really pushing the industry forward. You know, this, there's so much opportunity here when you look at peer industries, particularly in finance and banking and how far they've kind of embraced the digitization of this world. And, and we're just at that cusp. There's, I think, as we spoke about last week, right. When you think about some of the most important kind of roles out there in our industry are roles like, you know, the head of data science or data scientist, or, you know, folks in the analytics space or folks in kind of the software development and innovation space. That's a big sign that we're evolving finally. Mm. <laughs> and I think there's, um, there's a lot more to come with that, um, you know, in the next you know, two, three, five, ten 10 years, as, as we embrace truly a digitization to, to this world. Agreed on that. Um, certainly exciting times ahead. But look, John, um, thank you so much for joining us on the PropCast and I will catch up with you after the show. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for joining us this week on the PropCast and a big thanks to our special guests. Make sure you visit our website, www.nmre.co.uk, where you can subscribe to our show or you'll find us on iTunes and Spotify where all good content is found. Whilst you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate if you could rate and review us on iTunes. Or if you simply just spread the word. Be sure to tune in next Tuesday and I'll catch you later. Hi, this is Nelson from Property Quants. I'd like to invite you to join our Introduction to Data Science and Machine Learning for Real Estate seminar. To learn more, visit propertyquants.com slash seminar. And use special code LMRE20 on Eventbrite for a discount. You're listening to a Podcast Company podcast. This was made by Podcast Syndicator, where we help you go from start to grow to making money with your podcast. Let us help you share your message and your voice with the world. Reach out now, Jason at PodcastSyndicator.com or Brett at PodcastSyndicator.com to find out more. Thank you for listening, and do come back to hear nothing but the best podcasts.